Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Oregon Sea Grants Careers in Science Investigations webinar. We are excited to have you here today. This is our third of a series of webinars intended to connect students like yourselves with professionals working in the marine science field. My name is Lindsay Carroll, and I'm the Marine Education Coordinator with Oregon Sea Grant. I traditionally work out of Hatfield Marine Science Center, but now Hatfield is unfortunately closed. And so we're very excited to offer you opportunities virtually. So we encourage you to ask questions of our presenters. And so you can do that by using the question and answer function located at the bottom of your screen. It is labeled Q and A. You may answer, or you may, excuse me, you may ask questions throughout their presentations by using the Q&A, and we will get to as many of those questions as we can, as time permits, after each of their presentations. Before we get started, we would love to get to know a little bit more about you. So Kate Goodwin, our Special Projects Coordinator, is going to be launch launching two questions. Our first question is going to ask you to indicate which grade you are in or what grade level are you in. So are you in elementary school, middle school, high school, college, or are you an adult? We do still have some participants still joining, so it looks like we might still okay. be growing here. I think it's time to end the poll. Okay. All right, so it looks like we have about 7% in elementary school, 52% in middle school, 29% in high school, and 12% are adults. So Kate's gonna go ahead and launch our second question which is going to ask you to tell us where you're joining us from. Are you joining us from Oregon, the West Coast that is not Oregon, the Central U.S., East Coast, or are you joining us from outside of the U.S.? All right. Thank you, Kate. So it looks like we have 74% or 74 from Oregon, 7% from the West Coast, not Oregon, 9% from the Central US, 5% from the East Coast, and 5% from outside the US. That's awesome. Welcome, my friends. Okay, so thank you for letting us know a little bit more about you. It's now time to transition into our first presenter of the day. I'm sure we're all excited to hear from Dr. Shay Steingast. She works with Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife studying marine mammals. And so she's gonna tell us a little bit about that and a little bit of how she got to where she is today. So Shay, you can go ahead and share your screen and begin your presentation. All right. And how is that looking? That looks good to me. Okay, perfect. All right, well, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Shay Steingas, as Lindsay introduced me, and I'm the Marine Mammal Program Leader for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And today I'm gonna go ahead and walk you guys through what it's like to be a marine mammal biologist, uh, studying particularly seals and sea lions on the Oregon coast. So a little bit about me. Um, my name is Shay again. Uh, and you might be surprised to learn that I grew up not in Oregon or by the ocean, but I grew up in Wyoming. And I went to college there at the University of Wyoming and I studied animal science and veterinary medicine for my undergraduate degree, where I learned a lot about animal biology and health and individual um, physiology and anatomy. And I went to Oregon State University to the Marine Mammal Institute there. Um, in the Department of Fish and Wildlife, Fisheries and Wildlife, and I studied uh, harbor seal biology, which we'll talk a little bit about, uh, for both a master's degree and a doctorate program, and wrapped that up a couple years ago. So 
Um, with that little bit of background, I thought I would go into uh, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, a first, a little bit of background is, uh, what is a marine mammal? What makes a mammal a marine mammal? Uh, so first off, uh, not surprisingly, they are mammals, meaning that they breathe air, they have hair on their bodies, and they, make, they produce milk for their young. Um, the part that makes them marine mammals is that they rely on the ocean to eat, live, and survive. And there's five different groups of marine mammals you might be surprised to learn. Um, there's the group that includes sea otters, polar bears, there's a group called sirenians, which are manatees and dugongs. There's a group called cetaceans that include whales, dolphins, and porpoises. And uh, the group that I'm really involved in called the pinnipeds. And um, pinnipeds have many different species. So that includes seals, sea lions, fur seals, and even the walrus. So why are marine mammals uh, important when we look at our oceans? Well, first off, they're really visible. Uh, we can see them. And that's not always the case for every marine species. Uh, sometimes they're very small or uh, very deep water species. However, marine mammals have to return to the surface to breathe, which means it makes it easier, uh, easier for us to study them. They're also top predators, meaning that they're really dependent on the health of the ocean around them, as well as all of the species they depend on. So that means that they're a really good, what we call sentinel, or really good visible um, indicator of how our ocean is working and how healthy it is. Another thing that helps us um, study marine mammals is that they live for a long time. So we can study the same individual over many years, um, whereas for a shorter lived species, uh, like for example, a sea star, we couldn't, we couldn't necessarily do that. So the pinnipeds, um, again, are my specialty. So as I said, that includes seals, sea lions and fur seals, um, but you might be surprised to know that there's really two groups of pinnipeds. So sea lions are actually very different from seals. Um, sometimes when you hear seal, the word seal, you think of um, a brown animal that can sit up and bark, and that's actually not uh, what we call a true seal. That would be a sea lion. And they live, uh, or they are in part of this uh, family uh, that is called Odoriidae or Odoriids. And these are animals that can sit up on their hind flippers. They have an ear flap on the, the side of their head so you can actually visibly see where their ear is. And these sea lions are the animals that are able to bark. Now true seals are a little bit different. They um, cannot sit up on their hind flippers, so they kind of move along on their bellies on land. They do not bark. Sometimes they do make sounds like growls and such. Um, and they don't have ear flaps. They just have a hole uh, where their ear would be. Um, so next time you hear somebody say, oh, I heard a seal barking, you can say, nope, that was a sea lion. And the other cool member of the pinniped group is, of course, the walrus. And so the walruses are much like seals or sea lions, except for um, they have really large tusks and they also, they live specifically in the Arctic. Um, however, I'm not gonna talk too much about walrus today. So where I live and work is Oregon and we have a really beautiful coast here and we have a large number of pinnipeds. We have seals and sea lions as well as some fur seals that you don't see as often. And they're found all along the Oregon coast. Uh, the Oregon coast is a really rocky shoreline area and uh, it's over 300 miles long, meaning that it's a lot of ground to cover to study these animals. So my specialty throughout graduate school is uh, the Pacific harbor seal. So the harbor seal is this animal you see on the far left here, they are phocid or true seals, meaning that they um, move along on their stomachs, kind of like we talked about. They're uh, relatively small marine mammals. Um, they can weigh up to about 250 pounds, which seems pretty big, but uh, in the realm of other marine mammals, it's not very big. 
they eat mainly fish um, and they inhabit the continental shelf, meaning the shallow ocean uh, off the shoreline. So the middle image there, you can see um, that's me in the pink wetsuit and I'm putting a satellite tag on a adult male harbor seal there. We have his eyes covered so they don't get sand in them. Um, and then on the right, bottom right, you can actually see that tag that we put on. And uh, that is a very cool little uh, piece of technology uh, that I'll talk about later. And up top, you can actually see some other seals, those aren't harbor seals, with a whole array of different tags. And so tags are one of the ways that we can study marine mammals um, and be able to track them and understand what they're doing, even if we can't see them all the time. So what happens when you put a tag on a seal, like the bottom left here, is uh, that little tag um, can transmit a signal to a series of satellites. And those satellites can use that signal to determine where the tag is at on the planet. Um, so that's pretty cool to think that um, that tag actually transmits all the way past the atmosphere. Once those satellites figure out where the tag is at, it, the satellites then send a, um, a group of data down to a server or computer. And uh, that way you can actually, from, from my office or even from my house, I can log online and I can almost at any time know where those animals are at. So once you get all those data points back, there's a whole bunch of analyses you do. Um, and then you get something like you ha I have on the right, and that is a map of the Oregon coast. Um, or, or at least the, uh, <laughs> the northern part of the Oregon coast. And all those green areas are areas where the, uh, we had 24 harbor seals that we tagged. That's where they went. So that covers hundreds of miles. And then the pink areas are the areas that are most important for the animals. So that includes a lot of bays like Alsea Bay in Waldport or Yaquina Bay in Newport. So on top of putting a tag on seals, there's something else that is really cool that we can learn about them just by looking at their whiskers. So when we catch an animal, it's really good to sample as many things as we can because we want to learn as much as we can from that animal um, since we've you know, gone through all the trouble and stress of, of catching one. So you've probably heard the expression, you are what you eat. And that's true, um, not only in terms of health, but in terms of how your body is made up. So um, anytime we eat something, all of the elements or atoms in that food um, become incorporated in our bodies. So in my case, I like to look at carbon and nitrogen. Those are two elements that are very common um, in how human beings or any animal is made up. And um, so essentially, if you zoom in on that atom, what you get um, from a whisker is uh, you get different components of those atoms. And so you take the, you are able to take the whisker, you cut it into pieces along the length of the whisker. So they stay on for a year or more. And so you can actually get a timeline from that, uh, that single whisker that you have. And so depending on what you or a seal eats, the elements of carbon and nitrogen have forms that are uh, weighted differently and those are called isotopes. So when we compare the isotopes or composition of an animal with its prey, such as a fish, we can actually tell what the animal has been eating, such as a crab or a flatfish or a salmon. And so, even if we can't see what an animal is doing, we can actually do a little bit of detective work to learn um, what the animal's been eating, even if we don't uh, visibly see that in other ways. So that's pretty cool. We can take a whisker and we can learn about what an animal has been eating. And another tool that biologists use a lot is scat or poop. And uh, you might know that all animals poop and uh, humans included. Um, and so for biologists uh, or um, animal health specialists, that poop can actually contain a lot of information. Um, you may have 
taken your animal, your cat or your dog to the vet and they asked for a sample. And that's because veterinarians do the same things that we do as biologists to understand uh, how an animal is doing. So not only can poop tell us what an animal has been eating, but it can also tell us a lot of really cool stuff like the health of the animal, if that animal has been exposed to toxins, uh, parasites or bacteria, and um, we can actually learn about the animal itself. So these are some environmental toxins. Um, these are all things that may be found uh, in the ocean or the environment, and we can actually test for any of these um, in the scat of an animal. We can also learn about an animal's immune system, meaning how it keeps itself healthy, um, or look for things like parasites or bacteria that might be making the animal ill. Now, what else can we learn from poop? Um, first, we can look at the poop itself and look for any bones. We can identify the bones of those fish uh, to understand what was in that animal's last meal. Or the other thing we can do is use genetics to either learn about the animal itself, like was it a male or a female? Or we can actually do genetics on the scat too and find the genetic signature of the prey it's been eating for a really comprehensive list of species. So when we think about marine mammals, uh, they're in the water a lot of the time. And uh, on the Oregon coast, like I said, it's 363 miles long. So it would take a long time to tour the entire coast to count every animal. So uh, just as was posted in on the website here about uh, using small aircraft to count animals, uh, that's something that we can do annually. So we go along in an airplane, we take photos and videos of the entire coastline, and then go back later and count animals in those videos or photos. So if you want to see an image or a video of that, you can go back onto the website and see how that works. Um, and then finally, because some of the animals are in the water, we uh, then make an estimate of the animals we think that are not on land and add that to the count. And then if you do that every year, you can understand what the population is doing along the entire coast. So with that, um, those are just some, some things that you can do uh, with marine mammals uh, in order to learn about them. So we learned about the different types of marine mammals that are out there. We learned about tracking animals in the ocean using tags. We talked about how we can actually use seal whiskers to learn about how animals live. And we learned all the different things that poop can tell us as biologists. And finally, we talked about how we count marine mammals. So as you guys might see, science can help us learn a lot and that includes how animals live. We can learn about their health and what they eat. And we can also figure out how many live on our shoreline. So if you think about it, that's pretty darn cool um, uh, that you can learn that much about animals that live uh, so much of their time in the ocean that we often can't see. And so as you guys know, just to conclude, um, our oceans are changing really quickly and we have a lot to learn about them. Uh, marine mammals are, are everything about the ocean. So no matter where you're from, uh, if you're from Wyoming, even like me, you can still study the ocean if you want to. And the sooner you start learning, the sooner you can start thinking about a career in marine science. And just as a little additional note, if you are interested in marine science or marine mammals, biology and chemistry are probably the two more, most important subjects in terms of ocean science. And so with that, um, that was a really quick run through and um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Shay, for your wonderful presentation. We have a question from Isabel. How do you attach the tags? Thanks, Isabel. That is a very good question. Um, so the tags, believe it or not, uh, because seals have a lot of fur on them, we can actually just take a form of really quick drying glue and we can actually just glue the tag onto their fur. And so those animals will shed after a number of months and uh, the tags will just come off naturally. 
another way you can get the tags back is you can actually have a device that remotely detaches the tag for you. You can stand um, a distance away from the animals, press a button, and the tag pops off so you can go retrieve it. Great, Shay. Thank you. We have a question from Piper. Are true seals and fur, fur seals more alike, or are sea lions and fur seals more alike? I can All right, that that's, a, that's a really good question. So in that case, fur seals and sea lions are more alike because they are both what we call odoriads. And fur seals are just like sea lions where they can, uh, their back flippers, um, are positioned forward so they can sit up on them. Fantastic. All right, we have a question from another Shay, it appears. What do you like most about your job? Yeah, well, great name. Shay is always a good name. Um, what I like most about my job, I think there's two things. One, I love talking to people and teaching people about our oceans. And the other thing that I really love is getting to interact with animals on a day-to-day -day basis and try to do um, the best that I can for conservation and uh, for protecting our marine habitat. Thank you, Shay. And you touched on this a little bit, but a good question from Aaliyah is, how do I line myself up in college to study a certain marine mammal? And what classes should I take for marine biology? Yeah, that's a really good question, Aaliyah. Um, well, you know, there's no straight path. And what I will say is no matter what you do, it will always uh, translate to a skill that you can use later on. So I studied pre-veterinary medicine and that actually lined me up really well for marine mammals because I knew a lot about mammal biology that maybe some other folks didn't. Um, but then I also uh, studied ocean chemistry and that set me up to do things like the stable isotope work uh, with whiskers and all of that. So it's good to take a variety of classes that um, give you a good range of experience, um, but anything you can do to get out in the field or learn, just learn more about your animal and talk to people who study them, I think that's one of the most important things you can do. Oh, and class-wise, um, you know, I would say if you can take, even if you can take freshwater biology or um, wildlife classes, um, and then things like organic chemistry or oceanography that are a lot, you know, they're harder and they're more mathematical, but those are always really important too. Great, Shay, thank you. And one last quick question uh, from a couple of people. So I'm gonna combine some questions of, do the tags impact the seals? Does it impair their vision? And are they biodegradable? Wow, those are really good questions. Um, so as far as we know, the tags do not impact the seals and then we have very strict guidelines about how big those tags can be. So they can only be 3% of the animal's body weight. So if an animal were 100 pounds, it could only be three pounds. Well, the tags that we use are only a couple of grams. They're much, much smaller than that. Um, they don't impair their vision because we usually, um, it was hard to tell from the photo, but we, we put them on behind on the very back of the head. Um, so they probably can't even really see the antenna. Um, and the last question is, are they biodegradable? And so, no, they aren't. And the reason for that is because we, um, the other thing we don't want are any of the electronic components to come out of their housing. So um, the material we use is actually, it's biologically and chemically inactive. So um, it's not biodegradable, but it's also completely harmless. It doesn't break down, down into more toxic materials. Great, Shay, thank you so much. We appreciate your presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and transition here and introduce our next presenter, Alyssa Johnson, who works aboard NOAA ship Fairweather. And she and her team use sound to paint images of the seafloor. So Alyssa, you can go ahead and share your screen and start your presentation. All right. All right, can you see that just fine? Yes. All right, perfect. 
Uh, well, good afternoon. And uh, just to start off with a little bit about myself, my name is Allie Johnson. I'm the Chief Hydrographic Survey Technician aboard the NOAA Ship Fairweather. I've been on board for about three years and I got my uh, background in uh, my background, I guess. I'm actually from the Midwest, so uh, like Shay, I didn't grow up near the ocean, so that's, it was nice to hear there's another. Uh, and then I went to uh, college down in Florida, so I did go for uh, environmental studies, but um, so let's get on to more about what I do, though. So what do I do? I do uh, what is called hydrography. And hydrography is the science of uh, describing physical features of a body of water. Uh, but more simply put, it is uh, mapping the ocean floor. So just to get kind of an idea from everybody. So I have a chart up on the screen right now. And I was just wondering how many of you, uh, I think there's a hand raising function. How many of you have actually seen a nautical chart? There's a lot of hands raised. All right, well, that's great. Cause a lot of, uh, from the poll, it seemed like quite a few were uh, coastal. So this is actually of Yakina Bay and the numbers on the chart, for those of you that don't know, represent depths. Uh, and then here's my quest, another question for everybody. What unit of measurement uh, do charts in the United States use? Do you have any? We have about half of the people have cast their votes so far. So I'll right. give them a little extra time. Make your decision. Ooh, what are some of those words, huh? <laughs> okay, these are the results. All right, well, so we don't use meters over here. Actually, all the data I gather is in meters, but when it actually ends up on the chart, it's in fathoms. And fathoms is a kind of a fancier way to say six feet. So you just, one fathom is actually equal to six feet. So in a way, feet is sometimes correct. The chart uh, that I have up here is actually in feet because it's a pretty shallow area and important for transit. How many people, um, this is Kate, how many people said feet for their answer? What is the percent? 43% uh, said feet, 21% said fathoms, 34% said meters, and 2% said yards. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, but the information I gather is not only gives us the depth, like you see on the chart, but it actually paints a picture of the sea floor. So all the depths here are represented by colors instead of numbers. And so you can see uh, the deeper uh, dark blue color is the pretty deep areas, as that kind of makes sense. And then the shallow areas are red, uh, which also makes sense because that's kind of a danger zone. Maybe it's not the safest to, to transit into. So how do I do this? Well, we do this with sound. Essentially, we use sonars to transmit a pulse of sound uh, to the seafloor, and then the receiver in the sonar actually listens for the sound to return. So to get the depth, the equipment measures the amount of time it takes for the sound to leave and hit the seafloor and then bounce back to the sonar. The travel time of the sound is then divided by two, uh, this is because we don't need the round trip distance, we only need the one way distance. And then my next question, so dolphins and bats both uh, hear positions of objects in kind of the same way. Do you happen to remember what that is called? Mm -hmm. 
These votes are coming in much more quickly than the last question. <laughs> Probably more certainty. Yes, 78% have voted. Excellent. I'm going to end the poll now. All right, perfect. Yeah, pretty much everybody <laughs> said echolocation, which is correct. Great. So essentially, we're just using man-made echolocation on our, our ships. All right, so kind of what I'd mentioned before is that we use, uh, we get, let's see, sorry, one second. Uh, the, the main type of sonar that we use is called a multi-beam sonar. Uh, this is because it transmits over 250 beams of sound down to the ocean floor. And so this gives us a much more detailed view of the bottom than what you see on the charts. Uh, so on the charts, you'll just see a few scattered points. But in this image, another one of the seafloor, you can see all these great little intricate little ridges, uh, which won't show up on the chart, unfortunately. Uh, but we do this because we need to be able to, to look at the data and pick out the most important depths to display to the, to the mariner. So before we get into what's really needed, I wanted to bring your attention to this image here. So I, if you haven't seen it, for those of you who have been in Oregon, um, the, the great big white ships are what I work on, and they carry around these four small little boats. And these four small boats are deployed every day so that they can get out into the shallow waters that the ship can't safely survey. So think of them more as little ducklings that are sent out to venture around on, on their own for the whole day and they return back to the mama duck just in time for dinner, which is great. We, have, we do have very good cooks on board, which is wonderful. But that being said, let's see, my soundings aren't terribly useful by themselves. Uh, so there are a few other pieces of information that I need to get. First being, uh, I need to know how fast the sound is traveling. That's probably the most important. I need to know where the boat is located. I need to know how the boat's moving. And then I need to know the tide cycle or the height of the water in, relative, in relation to the tides. Uh, so to kind of recap that, I need to know speed of sound, position, movement, and tides. So speed of sound, uh, to get the, how, to figure out how fast the, water, the sound is traveling through the water, we drop this instrument here in the middle that's called a CTD over the side. And this takes little samples throughout the entire water column. So from the very surface of the water all the way down to the floor. And CTD stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth. Uh, conductivity meaning uh, salinity, essentially. We're trying to figure out how salty the water is. We get the temperature, which is a bit more direct of an observation, and then the depth, which we infer from gathering the pressure as uh, the sensor drops to the bottom. And then all of that information is plugged into an equation, which then gives us the speed of sound at each sample point down the water column. Fortunately, I don't have to do that math manually anymore. Uh, that's all put into a computer algorithm, thankfully. Um, but if you look over at the graph or the plot, as we like to call it, you can see they're pretty different from each other. And then not only that, but they change pretty dramatically from the top to the bottom. So this is caused from uh, the varying layers uh, found throughout the water column, which is a result of changes in temperature and density and salinity. So all of those things kind of working together can, can change the, the speed of sound even as you're traveling within the same area. Next, I need to figure out where I am. So first, if you take a look at these two little disks, uh, 
Those are our GPS antennas and they are placed one on each side of the boat so that we don't only know where we are, but we know how we're turning. And then we have this funny problem of the water, the water, excuse me, the water's always moving. So the boat's always moving. And so this yellow box in the picture is called an IMU uh, because for my field of study, for some reason, everything is an acronym. Uh, so it's an inertial measurement unit. Um, and this is used, it's placed in the center of the boat uh, and it measures very, very accurately how the boat's sitting in the water. So it measures how it's going up and down with the waves, it knows how it's moving side to side, and it records all of that information so we can apply it to our data later on. Then we need to know uh, the tide cycle. We need to know uh, what the tide is so that we can correct our data to what is called mean lower low water. Uh, mean lower low water is the average of the lowest low tides uh, throughout a period of time. And this is mainly done for safety. So all, all of the charts are displayed with the depths in mean lower low water so that if a boat travels into an area, they know that the depth at that time is, if it's something that's safe for them, it doesn't matter what the tide is, it will still be a safe depth for them to transit into. So then to give you a quick overview of one of the three screens I look at. So I have three different, well, I have two computers, but three screens that I'm looking at uh, while I'm surveying. Uh, this is just one of them. And it's a lot of information to take in, but it's really not so horrible once you get used to it. Uh, what I would like to direct your attention to is this kind of triangular screen at the bottom. This is called the water column views. And this allows us to see everything from directly underneath the sonar all the way down to the sea floor. Um, but so we can see uh, a lot more than just the bottom. We can see bubbles, uh, which is what the seep is pointing to. Uh, any kind of gases coming out of the ocean floor, we can see. Uh, we can see large schools of fish. And uh, we can even hear, we can even see other sounds, which is kind of a crazy thing to think about. And we usually refer to this as uh, interference or crosstalk. Usually this interference is caused by man-made equipment like other sonars or fish finders, but sometimes it can be caused by animals. Uh, in fact, some animals actually really enjoy what our sonars are saying and they like to stop by and chatter. Uh, what, what does that look like though? So I'm unfortunately not allowed on my ship right now um, because of everything that's going on. So I had to kind of draw this in for you. Here's a kind of a quick, it looks something like this. So think about if, yeah, it kind of looks fuzzy and it makes it hard for the sonar to actually find the bottom. Uh, and specifically, we found that dolphins really love to come by and chat with our sonars. It seems like they will go out of their way to, to come say hello. Uh, whales, they don't really seem to mind one way or the other. Um, so just some food for thought, some kind of why might we need to map the ocean? Well, surprisingly, some parts of the ocean specifically coastal parts of the ocean around Alaska, have not been mapped. Another reason is other areas haven't been mapped in over a hundred years. And at that point in time, they didn't have sonars. Uh, what they did actually do at the time was they had a, a long piece of rope with a weight on the end, and they would just toss it over the side and, and haul it back up and see how much of it's wet and measure it, which quite frankly, that leaves a lot of room for error. Uh, so if you take a look at the image here, you can see the red numbers, which are all the brand new depths that they found with the sonar versus the black numbers, which are old. And there's pretty big difference. Um, yeah, some of them over 20 meters difference. That's significant. Uh, the other thing, we really, really don't like it when ships run aground or hit rocks. Um, so that's half of the goal of my job is to make sure that ships don't hit rocks. Uh, 
Other parts of NOAA use our data for habitat mapping, so they have a better idea of where different species might be found. And then uh, parts of, say, like the Weather Service use our basin model, basin models to uh, make predictions about how much and in what way an area would be affected by a big event like a storm or a tsunami. And then additionally, kind of speaking of storms and tsunamis, we're, we're there to help for emergency response. So when a hurricane comes through and wreaks havoc in a, in a coastal port town, uh, we have to go in and make sure that the ports are safe to be opened again so that ships can bring the necessary supplies uh, to help everyone that's there. But not everything I do is just for charting. Uh, there have been a couple instances when I've been on board that uh, we've been asked to find sunken ships. Uh, these ships, frequently, they're very, very old. It, they've sank many, many years ago. But in 2017, the Coast Guard asked us to find the fishing vessel destination when it went down in Alaska uh, only a few months beforehand. So that was a, a pretty unique project for us. Additionally, we've had a few projects with the uh, U.S. Geologic Survey. To gather, one was to gather data over a mud volcano, which you can see here. Uh, that kind of big mound, the big green mound at the bottom is the mud volcano. And if you take a look at the gray images, we've gathered data about the seeps and how much uh, gas and uh, possibly like a mud slurry, they're thinking, could be spewing out from inside of it. The other project we did with the USGS was over the Queen Charlotte fault line. Uh, they wanted a much more detailed view of the full fault line and uh, because it's one of the most active fault lines in the world. Actually, I think it is the most active fault line in the world and it reaches from Vancouver, Canada up around the Gulf of Alaska and then down through the Aleutian Islands almost to Russia. Uh, and I have a video for you if Caitlin wouldn't mind playing it just to show you some of that data. Okay, let me share my screen here. Ooh, it went away. Can you see my screen with the yeah. video on it? Great. And is it moving? Yes. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Shall I keep going? Uh, that's probably good. Yeah. Okay. You can share your screen again. All right. Perfect. And And that's really, that's it. That's my uh, last slide. So thank you so much for listening and let me know. Uh, I'm here to answer any questions. Uh, this is my ship in case you are curious and we do work mostly in Alaska. Uh, but if you have any questions about ship life or what I do or Alaska, I'm available to answer. Great, thanks Alyssa. We have a question from Sheila. Can you tell from soundings what type of dolphin you're hearing? No, um, not yet. So at this point, uh, something that we've been discussing more among the hydrographic community is the fact that we're able to see that there are dolphins around. Um, apparently this is newer information for the uh, the marine mammal community. So 
that's something that they'll have to look into. That being said, I know you can identify based on like fish bladder size and um, uh, different uh, fish pod, fish ball groupings, school groupings, uh, the species of fish, um, but that's not something that we typically do. Great, thank you. And so how long are you usually on a ship at one time? This is a question from Shay. So typically how this works for my ship is we leave around April or May and we return in November. Uh, we'll go into port every couple of, every two or three weeks, but that's usually in a remote Alaskan port, never in our home port. Um, yeah, so I'm not home until then, but I do get to touch land. Great, thank you. We have a question from Sydney. What inspired you to choose your job? Um, I was actually volunteering with Gray's Reef, uh, the National Marine Sanctuary over in Georgia. And I had the opportunity to go with them out on uh, the Nancy Foster. And I really enjoyed the work. I liked, I thought that the sonar work was interesting. I thought I was going to be more uh, biology driven, but I, I decided I liked it and I applied and here I am. So, and Alaska is absolutely stunning, which helps. Fantastic. If I can squeeze in one more question. We have so many fantastic questions. What types of education? I think you briefly mentioned your educational background, but what, what type of degrees do these participants need to, to pursue a job like yours? Uh, so we've had a lot of people that have a geology background. Uh, I, there are at least a few that have a marine biology background. And then we also have a couple with environmental studies, environmental science backgrounds. Uh, so really, it's a pretty wide range. There's a ton of on-the-job training for this. So there's not really much of a degree. That being said, I would suggest learning uh, computer programs like ArcGIS. That's probably one of the more useful things you can show on your resume for this. Uh, because it shows not just that you can use that program, but you could learn easily the programs that we use. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you participants for your wonderful and engaging questions for both of our presenters. Thank you, Alyssa, for your presentation. Uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap up here. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today, but have no fear. Um, if you still have a question, go ahead and type it into the Q&A box. I'm um, going to go ahead and actually share my screen here. So go ahead and type it into the Q&A box. Um, because we will work hard with our presenters here after the fact and have them answer your questions and then we will go ahead and post those Q&A, like those answers to those questions on our website along with the webinar recording. So um, go ahead and add those questions if you need to. And then we also have a quick survey for you to fill out before you leave us. So Kate, if you can go ahead and drop that link into our chat window, please note that this chat window is separate from our Q&A box. So you can either click that link, fill out the survey, or you can copy and paste that link into your survey browser. And we also want to encourage you to register for our upcoming CSI webinars. We are very excited to offer a webinar every Wednesday at 4, 4 p.m. Pacific time. And so we, you can go ahead and visit our Career Day website. Um, go ahead, Kate, when you get a chance and drop that link into the chat box and you can click that link or you can copy and paste it into your web browser. So we encourage you to join us for our future webinars. Next week on May 13th, we're excited to have Lieutenant Junior Grade Michelle Lovano she is part of the NOAA Commission Officer Corps, also known as NOAA Corps, and she's going to tell us what it's like to combine a love for science with uniformed service. Okay, and so then we also have Dr. Scott Hapel, 
who it works in fisheries for Oregon State University. And he's gonna share a conservation success story about uh, the Nassau grouper recovery in the Cayman Islands. So if you're interested in ways to incorporate scuba diving into your future career, this may be a great webinar for you to tune into. This will be one option of, of ways to do that. And so I wanna thank our presenters one last time for their fantastic presentations. And thank you participants for your engaging questions. We hope to see you at a future webinar and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.